That concludes decision time. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. Business debate on motion number 14804 in the name of Kevin Stewart and Marshall Square. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I invite Kevin Stewart to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank colleagues who signed my motion for uh, allowing us to have this members' debate on Marshall Square today. And I'd also like to welcome Reject Marshall Square development campaigners to the public gallery this evening. I think it would be fair to say that almost every Aberdonian was pleased to hear that the former council headquarters, St Nicholas House, was to be demolished. It was regarded as a monstrosity, an eyesore, a blot on the landscape. Many hoped that its demise would lead to a sensitive development of the site and the construction of a city square to complement the iconic Marshall College and the historic Provost Skeen's House, which has been hidden from view for decades. Alas, that was not to be. Uh, and the Labour-led Council has pushed on with a scheme that is a, a, about as popular as a visit by King Herod to the Bethlehem nursery. Dave Urquhart, a contributor to the Reject Marshall Square development Facebook site, talks for many when he says, when the old St Nicholas House was demolished, we could finally see Provost Skeen's house and Marshall College in all their glory. The people of Aberdeen are crying out for this to be an open space, a civic square, but those who are meant to represent them are not listening. He goes on, why could this be? What financial millstone have the, these councillors draped around the people who live in Aberdeen, who work in Aberdeen, and are proud of Aberdeen? Fellow objector David McLeod says that the scheme is an architectural disaster, perpetuating its predecessor and imposing a financial burden on council taxpayers for many years to come. Many feel that the planning process was flawed, that the full impact of the scheme did not become apparent until 3D imagery of the development was produced by pinnacle visualizations. And it would be fair to say that folk were extremely disappointed that the Scottish government did not call in the application. However, I don't want to concentrate on the planning aspects of this today, but instead want to focus on the perceived lack of openness and transparency of the financial deal that Aberdeen City Council has entered into with Muse and Aviva. The Reject Marshall Square Development Campaign Group have been assiduous in trying to get to the truth about the deal. And Mr. Bill Skidmore has been at the forefront of these investigations. In a Freedom of Information letter to the Council, Mr. Skidmore asked for a copy of the business plan for the scheme and received a reply from the Council that said, there is no business plan at this time. There is no business plan at this time, and yet according to the campaigners, in the worst case scenario, Aberdeen taxpayers will be underwriting the risk of under-occupancy of the development by guaranteeing £175 million to Aviva shareholders over 35 years. It has been said by a great number of folk that it is somewhat ironic that Aberdeen City Council are willing to take on a risk that a multinational insurance company is not prepared to underwrite. In recent days, campaigners have managed to acquire two pages of the summary of the bids for the Marshall Square development, and I will hand a copy of these pages to the Minister after the debate this evening. I will also be sending these documents to Audit Scotland for their perusal. Yesterday, Mr Skidmore wrote to all Aberdeen City Councillors about the content of these documents. In his letter, he says, I got the impression when reading the summary bid information 
that the author was trying to steer councillors away from news. Too many unquantifiable risks, the need for a full life cost costing, a risk fund and a sinking fund to limit the damage of unquantifiable void periods over the full life of the lease. Instead, councillors were taken in by the prospect of £2.6 million income from the property, or nearly £100 million over the 35-year lease period, for a fully let scheme. This is undeniably a bad investment decision, he said, and one that represents worst value for the city when compared with the other bid proposals. And of course, all of these grand plans, schemes and strategies were drawn up at a time when the oil price was high, when Aberdeen was booming and when property was at a premium. Sadly, the outlook has changed, but has Aberdeen City Council's Labour-led administration changed its business plan to manage the new risks that have appeared over the horizon? No, because as we've already established, they don't have a business plan. Presiding officer, no business plan, but the council are required to upkeep, manage and maintain the building according to the summary bid information. The document says that these costs can generally be recovered from tenants, but what if there are only a few tenants? The document goes on to point out a number of other pitch pitfalls, which unfortunately I don't have time to go over today, but hopefully they will be poured. I'll certainly give way. Mike Russell. Uh, I would want to commend the member for achieving this debate. Unfortunately, I can't stay for the full debate, but I'm very struck by what you've said and what the uh, group have put forward in their documents I've read of strong parallels with things that have gone wrong in Argyll and Butte in my own area. I wonder if the member would also reflect and the minister would reflect on the need for greater supervision of local authorities. Audit Scotland, to say the least, doesn't appear to be well equipped to deal with this type of lack of democracy. Um, I would agree with Mr Russell on that point and I know that he has been working assiduously in trying to deal with some of the problems in Argyll and Butte uh, and there are certainly similarities between the two situations. As I, as I, was, I was saying, um, I hope that the documents that I'm going to provide the Minister uh, and Audit Scotland will be poured over uh, and they, they will look very carefully indeed at them. I'll leave the final words tonight to Kathleen Patterson whose words reflect the feelings of a great many Aberdonians. She says, the heart of the beautiful city of Aberdeen is being gradually murdered with every brick that is laid in this awful development. How can the councillors sit at their desk, listening to the work going on and the knowledge they are imposing something horrendous on their town? Something which will more than likely cost its taxpayers dearly and which given the current and predicted economic climate of the North East, will surely stand half empty for years to come. She says, open your eyes and ears, Aberdeen Council. Admit mistakes were made and rethink this project. With the help of all of those concerned, bewildered, angry and heartbroken citizens of your time. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now move to open debate. Uh, call on Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome this debate. I congratulate Kevin Stewart on bringing it. And I welcome the desire of all concerned to support regeneration of the city centre of Aberdeen. Marshall Square, of course, has its origins in the decision taken by a previous administration to relocate Aberdeen City Council's headquarters from St Nicholas House to Marshall College. That was a large scale and ambitious proposal. That divided opinion. That indeed was the financial millstone that left the City Council substantially in debt. Leasing Marshall College from Aberdeen University entailed a debt of £60 million. The demolition of St Nicholas House has cost several million more. I'd be delighted to. Mark MacDonald. I recall from my time as a member of that administration, Lewis MacDonald and his colleagues saying that the Marshall uh, College project would cost the Council over £80 million. It cost the Council less than £60 million. Surely he welcomes the fact that it was brought in so heavily under the budget that he assumed it would cost. Well, that's a remarkable Lewis contribution. Well. Mr Stewart has just talked about the financial millstone that has led to the Marshall Square development. And Mr MacDonald wants to boast 
that the financial millstone is a little lighter than it originally looked as if it was going to be. I will in a moment, I'm sure, but let me make some progress. Mr Stewart will recall that he was convener of finance on the City Council and at a key point in that process. He urged fellow councillors not to forget the multi-million pound asset that is St Nicholas House. The value of that asset could fund the costs of Marshall College. And that is, of course, precisely what is happening now. And despite the controversy, no party or group on the Council has brought forward proposals to leave the site of St Nicholas House undeveloped, because doing that would simply not pay the bills. After some debate, the City Council chose to demolish St Nicholas House and enable new development. And as we have heard, it has now sold the site to a pension fund on a leaseback arrangement with the right to buy it all back at a nominal price after 35 years. That is clearly a better deal for city taxpayers than the long lease of Marshall College, which generates debt rather than income. Uh, but as the campaigners have rightly argued, it comes with a degree of risk. Um, the uh, lease of Marshall College is an extremely uh, good deal um, over a 175-year period. Uh, and beyond that, the foresight of the previous administration actually saved an iconic Aberdeen building. Can I ask Mr Macdonald if he thinks that the buildings that are currently going up will be classed by any Aberdonians as being iconic? Mr well, Macdonald, I certainly I'll give you think... extra time given the length of the interventions. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm very good. I certainly think that it will be a lot easier uh, for Aberdeen City Council to recover value from the Marshall Square development than from Marshall College, which is clearly simply a drain uh, on revenues for the Council. £60 million of debt, as Mark Macdonald has said, will take quite a lot of uh, income in order to pay off. But there is a degree of risk, and that has rightly been said. And our report from Accountants EY yesterday commented on the remarkable resilience of the Aberdeen economy over the last year in the face of a low oil price and large-scale redundancies. And we must hope that that continues. But there is, of course, a risk that that resilience will fail to prevent recession. And there is consequently a risk there, only there, in, uh, that the Council's income from Marshall Square will fall short of the annual rent that is committed to pay under the leaseback arrangements. It is worth noting in that context last week's report from the Parliament's Local Government and Regeneration Committee, chaired by Kevin Stewart, which said that local councils should work with pension funds to secure infrastructure investment. Mr Stewart and his colleagues, uh, not at the moment, Mr Stewart and his colleagues urged councils to take a less cautious approach. They said without some degree of risk taking, innovation will not happen. Well, that's quite right. And Audit Scotland has looked at the innovative financing arrangements for Marshall Square. They do, did so and they concluded that the risks had been well understood and managed and they advised the Council to continue to manage its financial exposure to mitigate these ris risks accordingly. I hope the Council will heed that advice, but I also hope they'll heed the advice of Mr Stewart's committee not to be unduly risk averse. Aberdeen City Council can clearly demonstrate a proactive approach to the wider risks to the regional economy. Its proposals for a city-region deal, which are with ministers, uh, have cross-party support. Now, Opportunity North East is bringing together public and private sector partners to strengthen and diversify the regional economy with generous support, among others, from Surrey and Wood. They recognise that investing so that the local economy continues to grow is the best way to ensure that Marshall Square does pay for Marshall College rather than simply adding to the existing debt. I commend the campaigners who are here today for asking difficult questions. The project they did not want, as they will know, is now well underway. And I suspect, in spite of what we have heard so far, they will not hear any actual proposals this evening that would change that. I hope they will nonetheless maintain their commitment to our living, changing city. And I hope they and all of us will continue to strive for Aberdeen's future success. Many thanks. Now, Colin Mark Macdonald to be followed by Nanette Milne. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I, I want to pay tribute to the campaigners, indeed, in particular to my constituent, Bill Skidmore, who has sent a great deal of information to MSPs in advance uh, of this evening's debate. Uh, it certainly made for some interesting reading, uh, I can assure them of that. My colleague, Kevin Stewart, I think, has very... Uh, 
helpfully focused uh, on the issues around the business plan uh, or lack thereof uh, and the questions that arise off the back of that. I want to look at some of the wider impacts and risks that I think this development poses. But I can't allow some of the, the things that Lewis MacDonald said to go unchecked and unchallenged. First of all, uh, I think most people would accept and agree that the redevelopment of Marshall College has been a fantastic benefit to the city of Aberdeen. And if Lewis MacDonald's view if Lewis, if Lewis MacDonald's view is that any capital expenditure should be viewed as a millstone or a risk, then it's a wonder that anything ever gets developed in the city of Aberdeen, such as new school buildings, for example, at tens of millions of pounds, if Lewis MacDonald believes that we shouldn't be making tens of millions of pounds of investment uh, because of the potential debt that arises. Now, I've got, I've got more to come to yet. And then, and then Lewis MacDonald, uh, well, just, just a second, let me develop further. And then Lewis MacDonald... Uh, turns around and says that, uh, of course, the uh, local government committee have spoken about using pension funds for infrastructure investment. It's something I've spoken about as well, particularly public pension funds and especially public pension funds. But also the idea that pension funds who invest uh, then recoup the reward over time rather than simply transferring the burden of risk for that investment onto the local authority itself, which is what is happening in these circumstances. And then he says that uh, the local government committee have said council should not be overly risk averse. There's a difference, a fundamental difference between not being risk averse and being essentially blind or ignorant of risk. And that appears to be a dividing line that the Labour-led admin, Labour administration in Aberdeen have fallen off of quite spectacularly. I'll give way. Lewis MacDonald. I'm grateful, I'm grateful to Mr MacDonald. Clearly, Audit Scotland have not regarded the handling of this as either blind or ignorant. But if Mr MacDonald is suggesting that in some way Aberdeen City Council should cease to seek an income from Marshall Square, can he tell us how else he, he would have Aberdeen City Council pay off the debt accrued at Marshall College? Mark MacDonald. Well, one of the things which Aberdeen City Council ought to have done, first and foremost, is to have had a much more open and transparent process from the beginning, looking at the views of Aberdonians around the options that they wanted to see being developed, and then examined how those could have been delivered. I'm pretty sure what is currently being developed would not have been top of any of the... Uh, considerations. One of the other things which Aberdeen City Council did erroneously was to uh, vote against the wishes of the group that I was a member of uh, to demolish the building itself and un incur the costs around the de demolition of St Nicholas House to the council with no guarantee of what would come after, therefore taking an upfront cost with no guarantee of future income. That was a, a, another example of carelessness uh, in the face of risk assessment. But I want to look at some of the wider issues here, uh, presiding officer, in terms of wider impact and risk, because Union Street, the flagship street uh, in the city of Aberdeen at the moment, needs support, it needs investment, it needs a specific strategic approach. And what I fail to see at the moment coming forward is any sign of such a strategic approach. Indeed, it seems to be that development uh, and proposed development in and around the city centre is designed almost to prevent the recovery of Union Street, rather than to assist the recovery of Union Street. And Marshall Square will be another part of that process, uh, uh, another part of that problem in relation to Union Street, because that is a financial impact as well. Now, the opportunities are coming to the Council, and Lewis MacDonald, as he is now so keen uh, on Aberdeen City Council not being risk-averse, I'm sure will join with the calls that have been made by my colleague Councillor Jackie Dunbar for Aberdeen City Council to look to use the new powers that are being given to it in relation to business rates to look at uh, impact, look at a targeted approach to business rate reduction on Union Street to encourage independent retailers onto Union Street. That should be coupled as well, I believe, with a view of looking at how the upper levels of Union Street buildings could be utilised better, for example, conversion to flats and, uh, and other properties, which would enable, first of all, provision of accommodation within the centre of Aberdeen, but also reduce the space of buildings that are being let to retailers and enable those smaller independent retailers who exist in areas such as Rose Street and Thistle Street, for example, to perhaps be encouraged onto Union Street you with greater exposure, to those, greater footfall. That's the kind of approach that we want to be seen being taken in our city centre, not what is being done at Marshall Square at the moment, which is an opportunity only, it seems, for chain retailers who don't have a local presence to come in, set up shop in Aberdeen and potentially divert business away from some of these smaller independent retailers rather than an opportunity to enhance and promote them. That, for me, is one of the great shames about this.
Thanks so much. Now call on Dr Lynette Milne to be followed by Alison McInnes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased that Kevin Stewart has secured this debate because it allows us to discuss some very real concerns about the Marshall Squ Square development and about the planning system in Scotland today, particularly about public engagement in the process when a major development proposal is being considered. And I'll focus on this. <coughs> Excuse me. At this point, I should declare that my husband is a committee member of Aberdeen Civic Society, but neither he nor I had any direct input into consideration of the proposals to develop Marshall Square <coughs> in Aberdeen. I'd also like to acknowledge the very detailed briefing material sent in by the Reject Marshall Square Development Campaign Group ahead of the debate, most of which, unfortunately, I don't have time to deal with today. But this raised many issues with the process which was followed by the City Council, including the financial process. <clears throat> the latter has been thoroughly investigated by Audit Scotland, however, and I think at this stage we must accept that financial due process was, in fact, followed by the Council. <clears throat> Presiding officer, Marshall Square is a site of major importance to people in Aberdeen and, and far beyond. Neighbouring as it does two of the city's most historic buildings, Marshall College and Provis Skeen's House, with any development there having a major impact on their setting. With the removal of St Nicholas House, widely seen as a blight on the landscape of the city centre, there was an opportunity to do something iconic with the space which was opened up and to develop the site in a way that is sympathetic to Provis Skeen's house and which showcases and complements Marshall College, giving space and also attracting people to the area. The development which has been approved and is now under construction has shocked many Aberdonians by its sheer size, scale and density, already obliterating the imposing granite facade of Marshall College. At a recent summit held to discuss the effects of the downturn in the oil industry on the economic future of the North East and the steps required to secure it going forward, it was stated that Aberdeen needs an attraction which not only brings visitors to the city but also shows people from other parts of the world with the skills which we need to attract that Aberdeen is a great place to live and offers an excellent quality of life. But there's widespread feeling across the city's communities that the opportunity to develop an iconic attraction has been lost with Marshall Square, as it was just a few years back when proposals to develop Union Terrace Gardens were rejected by the Council, although that was before they reached the planning stage. But in fact, that would have been, I think, a sort of catalyst to, to the things that um, Mark MacDonald was mentioning about Union Street. Public opposition to the Marshall Square development has been intense with residents who have never before been active taking to the streets with placards and loud hailers to protest against it. And even at this late stage, asking the government to call in the planning application, seeking a moratorium on building until the public engagement exercise can be rerun. This is because they feel, par feel that the public's voice has not been listened to as part of the planning process, leaving them feeling totally disenfranchised from it. Presiding officer, the Marshall Square development I think, has exposed some fundamental problems with our current planning system. The public do not understand the process. When they turn out in large numbers at pre-application hearings and other public consultation events, as they did in the case of Marshall Square, they think they've registered their objections, unaware that to be valid, these objections have also to be formally submitted to the planning authority within the time allowed. In this case, the many hundreds of objections expressed resulted in only 44 formal submissions on the planning application. And understandably, people are outraged that their views were therefore not considered by the Council. In my opinion, this simply is not good enough in 21st century Scotland, when we're encouraging community involvement in all aspects of life. When important major developments like this are at issue, the process really needs to be changed to enhance community input. And I would urge the Minister to consider this as a necessary and an urgent improvement to the planning system which we have currently in place. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me firstly congratulate Kevin Stewart for securing this important debate. I, I was happy to support his motion. I have received many emails and letters from my constituents on the Marshall Square development, and all of them are against the scheme. Not one person wrote to me asking me to publicly support it. Um, and I completely understand their concerns. I too pay tribute to the tenacity and the determination of the campaigners. In my opinion, the scheme is utterly uninspiring and lacks any vision. It does nothing to improve the area aesthetically. It detracts and overshadows an iconic building. 
and it's a missed opportunity to do something distinctive and reflective of the architectural heritage of the North East. A series of planning decisions have left the city centre fragmented and there was a chance to use this site to create a civic heart that the, the, the citizens could be proud of. I'm not saying Aberdeen shouldn't have a new development and I'm not saying that the city should remain as it is. But what I am saying is that this development should have been much more ambitious. I mean, how many more shopping malls does the city need? But this debate is not about aesthetics, and, and truth be told, it's about the apparent financial irresponsibility of the City Council in approving the bid by Muse. I'm very much aware that the building works have already started, but it is important to reflect on the mess and what got us here. We've already heard from Kevin Stewart about the, lack, sorry, Kevin Stewart about the lack of business plans. We've also heard about the financial risks involved in the deal that Aberdeen City Council has made with the developers. And we've heard about the secrecy surrounding the deal. You know, we have to reflect on the fact that the Labour-led administration has regularly showed contempt for the city's residents. That the design going ahead was never subject to a proper public consultation. That Labour's finance convener sought to either mislead the public or was simply incompetent when he claimed that cancelling the scheme would cost £100 million in fees. These are important matters that deserve our attention. Muse have previously stated that they hope that a big name oil company will lease office space in the new development. Unfortunately, the last year or so has shown us in the North East how volatile the oil and gas sector is, how quickly opportunities fade, and how too much reliance on a single sector can damage other areas of the economy. Employment... Yes, of course, Mark. Well, does the member also agree that it is unlikely, given the developments at, for example, Prime 4 uh, and also the developments at ABZ by the airport, that oil companies are going to seek city centre locations when there are these other locations which will be located more, advantageous, more advantageously for the airport and the western peripheral route that will be available? Yeah, Mark McDonnell makes an ab absolutely fair point on that. Um, employment, retail and hospitality sectors have all been impacted. You know, the City Council, above many others, understands the peaks and troughs of the oil industry. And we, they do know that we have to um, deal with that. The reality is, just now, currently most oil and gas companies are looking to cut down on staff and on their space. The reality is that Aberdeen City Council and Muse agrees this deal when the city was in a better financial situation than it is now. But Aberdeen City Council should have had a robust business plan for the project and they should be able to show proof that they have contingency plans. They should be able to assure everyone that this new building will have a purpose and will be financially viable, even in the toughest of times, and yet they can't. Those assurances are currently missing. And accusing those who are raising these valid concerns of playing politics is disgraceful. And I support Kevin Stewart's motion. Many thanks. Now I call on Graham Day to be followed by Richard Baker. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think there's others who've contributed already. Uh, I suspect I, I rise to speak as much as an Aberdonian as an MSP, even though I've lived longer in the constituency I represent here in Parliament than I did the Granite City. It will, in many respects, always be home. So it pains me to say this. Aberdeen City Centre has been destroyed by the planning decisions of successive local government administrations, with Union Street a deathly pale imitation of what it once was and indeed ought to be. But along came a wee glimmer of hope in the shape of the demolition of the blight that was St Nicholas House. A chance to create an open space, a chance to let Provost Skeen's house breathe. An opportunity, more than anything, to allow Aberdonians and visitors alike to view Marshall College and Greyfriars Kirk in all their glory. I managed fleetingly to avail myself of that opportunity when I was home in the summer. I have driven up Upper Kirkgate many times over many years. But for the first time ever, I travelled those yards, able to gaze upon the magnificence of the Marshall College. It was a genuine wow moment, a magnificent piece of granite architecture, at long last freed of obstruction and able to be viewed as it ought to be viewed. But not for long, of course, work was already underway to construct Marshall Square. So let's consider what Marshall Square is actually offering. 173,500 feet of grade A office accommodation and associated car spaces, like there's no shortage of available office space to be found within the Granite City. 26,500 square feet of retail and restaurant space. Well, forgive me, but aren't the St Nicholas and Bonacord centres located within a couple of hundred yards of this spot, offering just that? And isn't it the case we also already have the Union Square development, enticing shoppers away from the retail heart of the city? And a 126-room hotel, well, I thought Aberdeen was pretty well served in that regard. I think actually over recent months it's seen a 30% under-occupancy rate. 
But in terms of the shopping element, don't just listen to, to we, the politicians. Let's consider the views expressed by Mary Portas, who I'm told is an expert in town centre retail. As she tweeted on a recent visit to the city, Aberdeen Council are letting a shopping build in Marshall Square while Union Street is slowly dying. What? Or a beautiful granite stone buildings on Union Street being left while money pumped into a new build by Aberdeen Council. Madness. To be fair, the development does allow for 14,500 square foot civic space in front of the historic Provost Skeeds House. Only, whilst you'll be able to gaze on the splendour of that particular construct, you won't be able to see Marshall College because, barring a narrow passageway, it will be completely blocked out by some of the buildings hosting these retail, restaurant and hotel facilities. But it's the missed opportunity represented here that's so sad. The chance to say enough is enough to these sorts of developments, to turn the spotlight on the beautiful buildings the city already has, and in retail terms, concentrate on reviving Union Street. And then, of course, we have the financial aspect to the deal with Aviva Investors and Muse Development Limited, whereby Aberdeen taxpayers are underwriting the risk of under-occupancy of the development by guaranteeing shareholders £175 million over 35 years. And that financial arrangement, I think, creates a potentially significant problem for the Council, beyond just the threat of having to fund an underutilised Marshall Square. Doesn't this arrangement potentially place councillors in a rather difficult position when it comes to deciding upon future planning applications if Marshall Square is underoccupied? Will it potentially weigh them open to accusations if they turn their applications for significant size city centre, retail, restaurant or office developments that they are doing so in order to protect Marshall Square and the council's financial exposure there? Perfectly valid and justifiable decisions could be called into question on these grounds. Legal challenges could be mounted claiming that councillors may have been predisposed to rejecting such applications because of the possible implications for council budgets if they grant it. If this, if this project isn't a rip-roaring success, it could create all kinds of difficulties for future council administrations over the coming decades. Presiding officer, this all comes down for me to one simple question. Can Marshall Square be justified on any grounds? The answer I and many others believe is no. Many thanks. Now, Colin Richard Baker, after which we move the closing speech to the Minister. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I also begin by congratulating Kevin Stewart on securing this debate? Because the future of Aberdeen City Centre is an extremely important issue and rightly excites strong opinions, including from uh, the Marshall uh, Square uh, campaign group, who we welcome to Parliament uh, this evening. People care greatly about the City Centre. They're concerned about its current state, as we heard from a number of members, they know its improvement is vital for our local economy, particularly in these greatly challenging times for the oil and gas industry. The Marshall Square plans have been, as we've heard, the centre of very heated debate, as before that were the plans for Union Terrace Gardens. And as someone who supported the exciting plans there have been previously for a new contemporary arts centre to be based in the gardens, I'm disappointed that ultimately they did not go ahead. But in the midst of all this debate on Marshall Square as well, uh, and much disagreement, there is a consensus that our city centre must change and must be uh, improved. I know our bidding city council is absolutely committed to making that change happen. The Marshall Square plans are part of that. But of course, on an even wider scale, there's the ongoing work on the city centre master plan, the strategic approach to which uh, Mark McDonald referred to and to which the administration is committed. And whatever views there may be on the plans for Marshall Square, I think we should all be able to agree that the new development will be a significant improvement on St Nicholas House, which uh, had stood in that site for so many years, and as Lynette Milne said, was not a building that had been widely regarded or cherished by the residents of Aberdeen. Mr Stewart. Um, I, th I thank the member for giving way, and uh, it's interesting to hear him now come out in favour uh, of the Marshall Square development because he wouldn't do so in the run-up to the general election where he was a candidate. Um, but I would disagree uh, with Mr Baker and I would ask him for the proof of where he thinks folk uh, think that the new development will be better uh, the St than the St Nicholas House uh, situation. Because what I've heard from residents of the city is what we are doing is replacing one ugly skyscraper with four ugly skyscrapers. Well, I've heard a little talk, extra but the great majority of people I speak to in Aberdeen, no one's expressed to me the idea that this will be detrimental compared to St Nicholas House. And I actually expect that even some of the speakers in this debate who've, who've, who've come with a view not in favour of Marshall uh, uh, Square uh, hold the opinion that Mr Stewart's just expressed. So, one, we know there are people who do not support uh, these plans. Of course I accept that. Uh, there are other people who want to see this kind of environment 
for retail and leisure in the city centre, which Marshall Square will provide. And Union Square ha already has proved highly popular, indeed has plans to expand. I haven't got time, Christian, I do apologise. There's an important element to the finances which will accrue to the Council through the Marshall Square project. And given that our City Council receives significantly lower funding than other local authorities, that's got to be a key consideration for the administration as they seek to protect funding for services. And you know, while concerns have been raised tonight on the matter of the finances of the scheme, I'd point out to members that Audit Scotland report on the financial plans uh, found that good practice had been followed. And on the issue of a business plan, I understand there was no business plan for the Marshall College scheme as well. So, presiding officer, that the work on Marshall Square is proceeding, but doubtless that wider debate on the future of Aberdeen City Centre no, no, the will continue not because way, it's Stewart. such an important issue for the future of the city. On that, we can all agree. And I know that there is also broad agreement on the need for an Aberdeen City Region deal. That's important, given infrastructure investment is a key element of that deal, offering further opportunities to develop our city centre. It's good that the City Region deal bid offers that opportunity for transformation of the city and that it's supported across parties, across governments, and, of course, by the two councils as well. Aberdeen City Centre can be the attractive and vibrant place we all want it to be helping bring more people to visit, work and live in Aberdeen and enjoy all our great city has to offer. That's a goal which not only lie at the heart of the work of our council, but should be a common endeavour for all of us who represent the city. I hope the Minister will confirm his support for that vital work at the end of this evening's debate. Hey, thanks. And we now move to closing speech from the Minister, Mark Abiyaji. Seven minutes are there by a Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, this is clearly an important issue, as we've seen from the debate here. And I say that not just as a local government minister, but uh, I would say it to the member as one city centre MSP to another. The key questions that are triggered here of heritage, of finances, how to plan the best use of a short uh, supply of space in a city centre are big questions and feelings will run deep. The evidence of that is clear from Aberdeen. Street protests, one led by the member leading the debate, participants in the thousands, um, even as Graham Day highlighted Mary Portis weighing in. We've seen a sustained campaign to influence local decisions. And I'd just like to say, in the spirit of recent Scottish politics, where we have been willing to commend people's willingness to get involved with debates, regardless of which side we are there on, I would commend the willingness and energy shown by the citizens of Aberdeen who have become active citizens engaging on this. Whichever position you take, the determination is a thing to behold, and we would, as a society, benefit if more people engaged so actively with local issues. Yes. Um, so, Stewart. can I correct the Minister, because I didn't lead any of the protests. The protests have been led by the citizenry of Aberdeen, and I think that shows the groundswell that there is. Um, my, my substantive point, though, is, does the Minister think that the Community Empowerment Act can make a difference in allowing folks the opportunity to have their voices heard, unlike this current situation where they have been ignored? Minister? I think I was using the word lead in a purely physical sense, uh, based on a photo I'd seen. Uh, I, yes, I do. I, I, I do think the Community Empowerment Act is, is really important here, and that was actually what I was about to comment on, some of the wider issues raised here before homing in on the specifics. And the Community Empowerment Agenda is all about tackling not the, just the inequalities of wealth and income that we have in this country, but the inequalities of power and influence. We have only, sadly, 22% of people in Scotland feeling that they can influence local decisions, and that has to be higher. There are a whole series of initiatives in community empowerment to try and get away from adversarialism and focus on positive suggestions and partnership working. We have participatory budgeting, which we are rolling out to get people directly involved in spending decisions. Perhaps crucially for this uh, question, participatory planning issues such as charrettes. We've funded 31 of these since 2011. They're an intensive way of getting communities proactively involved at the start, as Mark Macdonald really highlighted, to, to provide that vision of what people want. Um, in July, we committed £300,000 more for 2015-16, and as ever, we received um, more applications than we could fund, but the appetite for this form of empowerment is very clear. Mark uh, the, the Minister may be aware that a charrette was uh, undertaken in my constituency uh, in relation to the Grand Home Estate, uh, and that charrette 
predated uh, that uh, the process in relation to Marshall Square. So the, the process of charrettes ought not to have been alien to the Council when it was undertaking the Marshall Square project. Minister? I think the, the member has made his point there. Uh, on the, the wider, uh, you know, clearly charrettes have, charrettes have been around and they represent one particular way of doing a very intense participative participative planning, but the principles are good practice that can be deployed through all kinds of other uh, methods in planning. Uh, we have, to answer the point of Nanette Millen, an independent panel reviewing the Scottish planning system at the request of the Cabinet Secretary, and its membership includes Petra Bieberbach of PASS, formerly Planning Aid for Scotland, and it's identified community engagement as one of its key issues. The call for evidence closed on the 1st of December, and the report is expected in May, with any changes based on the recommendations to follow after that. All of this is the generality here, but there is the specific. There is no doubt that this is a crucial issue to Aberdeen, and it brings home that we shouldn't treat council elections lightly. Local authorities are responsible for vital services, for emotive decisions, and for £16.5 billion in gross expenditure every year. Local democracy matters, and local democracy gives councils a mandate and a way of being held accountable for decisions not supported by their electorate, just as we are in this chamber. Dennis Robertson. The Minister um, for taking the intervention. Uh, local democracy matters. Alison McInnes in her contribution said that only 44 uh, uh, submissions uh, came in against the planning, but many hundreds were out in protest. The Council ignored democracy. Minister. Well, there is clearly a debate ongoing. There is, uh, and, and people from all sides are having their say and will have all kinds of opportunities through the electoral and democratic processes to make, have their say as well. We, as a government, believe in local decision making. We intervene in extreme cases and have only powers to direct in specific circumstances. We have no power to generally direct local authorities, and frankly, long may that remain so. So any power we have goes through the statutes passed in this parliament and in limited cases. In that respect, Marshall Square lies beyond any reach of Scottish ministers at this point. Planning permission has formally been granted by the local authority, so can't be recalled by ministers, and we must also act in respect of that decision. Nor is there any evidence that the council has failed in a statutory duty under the 1973 Act, which could trigger powers as well. And Audit Scotland has concluded that relevant transactions have been appropriately accounted for in its 2014-15 annual audit of Aberdeen City, and appropriate processes have been followed in a financial sense. The Scottish Government's power to direct following a recommendation by the Accounts Commission therefore won't be engaged on grounds of best value. Um, but while there have been criticisms of Audit Scotland this evening. They are our established independent body and the Scottish Government must have regard to them and indeed the powers are only triggered when through their work with the Accounts Commission uh, they would recommend something. But I would return to where I started on this that Audit Scotland did look at the finances, but this is a political decision. There are issues that are much wider than the finances, the opportunity cost, other uses of the square, the advisability of investing in one project over another. All of these are within the scope of reasonable local political debate, and it would be understandable for people to come to different conclusions about the advisability of the plan, uh, just as it is within the scope to view administrations positively or negatively. Planning permission was passed in a close vote of councillors. The Muse deal was passed in a close vote of councillors. This has been an issue of controversy, and I expect that controversy to continue. The member has brought that debate here and is to be commended for acting on his views as a local representative and giving that debate more space to, to take place. This government is subject to constant attacks from parties over there and indeed over there about centralisation and being called on to intervene in local decisions on everything from planning to social care. This minister believes in local democracy. Well, but let me restate to conclude very clearly what my predecessor said to Kevin Stewart last year, and that is that our actions do not constitute giving approval to the proposal or agreeing with decisions taken by the Council, we are merely acknowledging that it is in the Council's area of responsibility. And just as we want to see empowered communities, we also want to see responsive democracies. The first 
without the second will only lead to cynicism and disengagement. It's only when all levels of government are truly realising the Christie principles of prevention, performance, people, and especially partnership and participation that we will have flourishing village, town, and city centres and everyone able to look with pride on the place they call home. Many thanks. Thank you all for taking part in this important debate. I now close this meeting of Parliament.